Could you? Yes, you can do that. Yes. Okay. And also maybe you can remember to you can I think I I think it's a good idea to remember to start the YouTube one. Ah yeah, I'll do. So someone has logged in and wished us good evening. So we should reciprocate. Yeah. Hi, Subrat again. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'll put my phone on do not disturb, so I don't. Need <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think we will um, because we are dealing with um, school people. So we will ah. probably give them two, three extra minutes, right? To kind of sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, yeah. the other speakers are not here, right? I think uh, Shubhroto will join on uh, you know pretty much on time. Uh, Vijay might be slightly later. Acha. Yeah. So so you said the order is you go first and then Shubhroto. No, I go first in the sense that I just do the introduction to the event. Uh -huh. because you know that 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 first very short introduction i'll do to what okay. this is all about okay. then you uh, you are the first uh, topical speaker fine okay fine Thick. and i'm now no you're not the first sorry shubhrato is the first topical speaker because he's talking about electrons and atoms so it goes up as you can see fine uh, so that people can use the information from the previous person so shubhrato we need least information then you go in because you'll talk about information <laughs> Fine. Okay. Then Vijay comes in because I don't know what exactly he's going to do, but maybe he'll use some of your uncertainty and all. Then I come in. Job is easier. Okay. Fine. Uh, yeah. So that is how it is. And of course, um, you know, I I can always play with around with the time in the end in case there is some. And there are questions at the big in the middle, or the questions all at the end. See the. I think it'll be good to have a five minute question. I mean, if if people are actually uh, going to stick to the fifteen minute, like you guys actually do the fifteen, uh, pretty much. Hello. Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Hello. Us. No, no. I think somebody else has joined us with video on. Um. Yeah. So if we have, uh, if we do that, then we can do five minutes after every talk, right? right. Okay. And then in the end, we can also have another five ten minutes for people who. We don't want to extend the individual thing beyond five because otherwise we'll overshoot, really right. overshoot, right? Sure. Yeah, I will need to leave at eight about sharp, but I'll stay late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, you know, that is the idea. So hopefully at eight, we would have started another question answer thing. At eight, um, another question answer. Thing. Oh, sorry. I thought not at eight, maybe 7.50, according to the current way I'm planning it. So it's 20 minutes per speaker, so 80 minutes. I'm going to do five minutes in the beginning, so 85. So we would start at 7.55, another five, 10 minutes for speakers, rounding up. No, only 65, you're saying. No, no, we have four speakers, no. Oh. So first we have Shubroto, then we have you, then we have Vijay, then I'm speaking on communications. Oh, I four yeah. speakers. Oh, I see. Take it. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, that is how it will be, but I'm sure we'll have a little bit here and there. But then anyway, we'll end around 8, 8, 5. Okay, fine. Take it. Yeah, yeah. So we have people already coming in, but we but then we will start with two minutes to you know we'll sure. overshoot from from now itself because I think it takes a bit of time. Sure. Yeah. 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 Hi, Subrato. I see you there. Hi. Hi you? Okay. I don't yet see Subrato. How are you? Good. Good. How are you? I'm fine. Thank. Oh yeah. Now I see you. Yes. Oh man. Okay. So I just. Uh... So is there any reason that we are having this today and not on the 14th of April? Um, 14th of April is a holiday uh, for the uh, schools also. And so oh, I'm right. told that many people, because it's a long weekend and all. So ah, many, see, um, many people might, you know, just want to sort of not right. be around, right? So then we'll, uh, yeah, that's why we wanted to do it when they are definitely in session and all. I see. 14th April is a, as you know, it's, uh, uh this ambedkar jayanti right okay it's it's a holiday for ambedkar jayanti i see yeah yeah yeah, okay. yeah. stop sharing it for a moment <clears throat> oh, um, excuse like to... me uh, i have a question yes uh, ma'am in quantum mechanics it is said that uh an electron has a duality, wave particle duality. So how can an object be both a, a wave and a particle? Yes. So Shubhroto Mukherjee, who's a professor of <laughs> IIC, <laughs> talk on looking at looking at atoms and electrons. So maybe so what we will do, Shopam, right? 
Okay. So, yes. what we will do is we will uh, keep this question for him to tackle. Uh, maybe one when he's giving the talk, maybe he already has thoughts on it. Otherwise, he'll answer it. But right I mean, I, I, in, in my talk, I'll, I'll use the fact that electrons, which you might normally think of as particles, are you know are also waves. Hmm. But your question is, why is it that they're both particles and waves? Okay, How so is that's it possible? The, okay, I mean, it clearly is possible, but you have to uh, know what you actually mean when you say that. So it depends on what it is that you're trying to measure. So, I mean, in some sense, the most correct answer that you can probably give is depending on what property of the electron you're trying to measure, it appears as a particle or as a wave. And you can't really measure a particle-like property and a wave-like property of the electron at the same time. So, so that's, uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but you know, I think in simple, Terms, that's probably the most correct thing that I can say. Would you agree? Okay, uh, is <laughs> it because of, you? of the uncertainty principle? Well, it's related to the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle is telling you that you can't at the same time measure a wave-like property and a particle-like property. If you try to measure yes. both at the same time, then you can't measure both of them accurately. That's, that's what the uncertainty principle is telling yes. you. You can measure both the velocity and the position of it. Right. It turns out that the position is like a particle-like property and the velocity or the momentum is like a wave-like property. Okay. okay uh, now I get it. So great. Thank so you. we've right. started on a very uh, high note uh, then. Thank you for, <laughs> right, for starting it really well for us. So what we will do is first of all, I'll request my um, uh, organizer, Shomo. Swami Ranjan Behra, are you there? Can you please start the YouTube uh, live stream? I think some, one, one or two people are telling me on WhatsApp that it has not yet started. So kindly start that. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, we then uh, begin on a, <laughs> let us begin again. Uh, we already began on uncertainty. So I'm hoping that uh, our program is going to be more certain. So welcome everyone, all those who have already joined and all those who are joining uh, in a bit, I suppose, uh, to uh, our event, Quantum at School. Uh, which is organized by the Quantum Information and Computing Lab at RRI, Bangalore, India. Uh, I am Urvashi Sinha, and I'm a professor at RRI, and I'm also heading uh, this particular lab. Okay, so uh, the, what is the aim of this program? The aim is to excite, educate, and inform you about the area of quantum science and technology, and uh, which, of course, is based on uh, a branch of physics called quantum physics, okay? And so some, some uh, so we will have some discussions on this as we go along. So now this quantum at school event is a part of many such events that are happening globally. Okay, so this is the event from India, but we have many such events happening in different uh, countries. Uh, all of them are aimed at this particular thing of educating, informing and exciting young students from school uh, in this domain. Okay, so, and this is a part of what is called the World Quantum Day which is on 14th of April, okay? And this, uh, this is a, an, uh, uh, an event which is aimed at organizing and, 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 you know, and promoting various quantum related activities to make people aware of quantum science and technology around the world. So quantum at school is a part of that. And I'm the Indian representative for this World Quantum Day Network, okay? Now quantum is a very um, you know, promising area of research. And uh, there are uh, different, so because we are talking primarily to uh, high school children, so there are many uh, interesting things one can do after school to get into this sort of field. Okay, so one is uh, like what most of the, you know, all the speakers today are, have followed more or less the same route, which is, you know, finish high school, then have an undergrad degree in physics, maybe, then an, a master's degree, then you go on to a PhD, then perhaps a postdoctoral experience and then you have a faculty position so we are all we've all followed the same uh, trajectory but then quantum is a field in which you need not follow this conventional trajectory you can also get into this from an engineering degree okay and you have a lot of companies and startups and industries and government agencies interested in quantum so there is a lot of uh, thing uh, that uh, one can do actually in the domain of quantum science and technology and so with that, uh, I think I will, uh, you know, uh, move on to uh, the, uh, you know, list of speakers who we have today. So we have four speakers today uh, who are going to tell you a little bit about uh, different aspects of this field. So our first speaker is Professor Shubhrato Mukherjee, uh, who is from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. 
and who's going to start uh, with looking at atoms and electrons. So uh, I hand over the floor to Shubhroto. Right. Um, thanks a lot, Urgoshi. Before I start, I see there's yeah. a message that says that the YouTube stream isn't working yet. Yes. Uh, do, you, so do you want I'm, me to start anyway? Um, yeah, I think we can start. And I think okay. this will be fixed, you know, because uh, sure. this may require the computing section. So we might want to start. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, let, so let me share my screen. Uh, let me know if my screen is uh, visible. It is visible and you want to okay, make it full fine. screen perhaps. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, and maybe I can uh, move all this. How do I get rid of this uh, bar here? Once oh, screen. you have a bar. Uh, For us, we see your full screen. Oh, okay. So you're not seeing this bar. All right, no. so only, only I'm seeing it, fine, yeah. okay. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Urgushi, for um, inviting me to this uh, um, program. And also thank you everyone for joining. So as the title of my talk says, I'm going to tell you um, how you can look at atoms and electrons using the principles of quantum mechanics and how this is actually implemented in, in laboratories, in research laboratories. Um, okay, so let's just get into this straight away. So when you think of what kind of instruments you use to actually look at tiny objects. So the most common laboratory instrument to look at very small objects is an optical microscope. And I'm sure uh, most of you have one of these in your, at least one of these in your school laboratories. And so the basic principle is that you shine light on a sample which you know, has some very tiny objects you want to see. And then the light that is reflected by this sample or this object is collected in some way through some particular assembly of, of optical components like lenses and mirrors. And then either you look at that reflected light with your eyes and see the image, or maybe that reflected light is collected and an image is formed digitally. Uh, but either way, the important thing is that you're using visible light to image tiny objects like, you know, say cells or certain microorganisms and things like that in uh, an optical microscope. Now it turns out that the smallest object that can actually be imaged using such a microscope uh, is about 0.2 microns. For those of you who are not familiar with what a micron is, a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. So this is about the smallest object that you can image using um, an optical microscope, a very powerful one. Now, if you want to see atoms, of course, you know that this is not good enough because as you probably learned, atoms are much smaller. Atoms are typically of the size of what's called an angstrom. And an angstrom is something which is one ten millionth of a millimeter. So much, much smaller. And so clearly atoms cannot be observed with an optical microscope. So if you want to see them, what do you do? So let's first ask, why is it that optical microscopes can't be used to observe something smaller than you know, 0.2 microns? And so the answer to this is actually found in 12 standard textbooks, uh, for instance, the CBSE textbook, which tells you that what gets in the way of being able to observe something smaller is something called diffraction. And so the idea is that the lenses that you're using to image actually have a size. And so therefore they don't really act as the perfect lenses that you learn about in textbooks, meaning that an object which is a point does not form an image which is a point. Instead, the image actually is some kind of a ball or a blurb or something. And so because of this, you can't actually distinctly make, <clears throat> make out points which are very close to one another. And that imposes a limit on how small an object it is that you can see. And in fact, there's a formula for that, which is also in your 12th standard textbook. So when you put all these things together for the best available optical microscopes, you find that the smallest size of something that you can see under a microscope is roughly half the wavelength of the light that you're using to image. Okay, all right. So then you can say, well, you know, you have this formula. And so if you have to use light to image something that's like an atom, why not just use light which, is, uh, which has a tiny wavelength, like two angstroms or something, if you want to see something which is the size of one angstrom. So it turns out that it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, and that's because if you look at what kind of light actually has a wavelength of two angstroms, it's really not visible light, but X-rays. And as you also learn in um, your 12th standard physics textbook, and this is you know, one of the first principles of quantum mechanics that we'll be using, that light is made up of particles, which are called photons. And these photons have some energy and momentum just like any other particle. And in fact, the energy and the momentum depend on the frequency. The higher the frequency, the more the energy and the more the momentum of uh, the light particles. And so if you want to use X-rays to image things the way that you would normally image them with uh, regular light, 
it turns out that it doesn't work because these X-rays are just too energetic to just simply bounce off atoms and other objects like visible light does. And it also turns out that it's very difficult to create optics for X-rays, that X-rays don't e <clears throat> refract very easily. And so you can't make lenses for X-rays. So because of all of this, X-rays or you know, light of a much smaller wavelength is also unsuitable for imaging atoms. But here's where something else comes in. So we know that quantum mechanics tells us that things that you think of as particles are also waves. And so electrons are also waves. And these electron waves also have some wavelengths. So in fact, if you look at an electron of wavelengths to angstroms, if you look at an electron wave of wavelength to angstroms, that actually has much less energy than a photon of the same wavelength, than a light particle of the same wavelength. And so in some sense, these electrons can bounce off things much more easily uh, without causing too much damage. And these electrons, unlike photons of two angstroms, can also be refracted and reflected. And they can be refracted using magnetic fields. I'm not going to go into the details of that. So anyway, long story short, so what you can try to do is, instead of using light of a very small wavelength to try to image atoms, you can try to use electrons instead, which are also waves uh, of a fairly small wavelength. And that is the principle of something that's called a scanning electron microscope. So on the left here, I have a picture of what a scanning electron microscope actually looks like. This is one of these microscopes in a laboratory at my institute, ISC Bangalore. And it looks you know, fairly complicated. It, 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 it's a pretty big instrument uh, compared to an optical microscope. But if you look at the kinds of pictures that it takes, if you look at this image here, so on the left, you have an image of a particular object. Uh, I'm actually not even sure what it is, uh, obtained by an optical microscope. And then you have an image of the same object obtained using a scanning electron microscope. And you can see that the scanning electron microscope gives you a much better image. It can also highlight much smaller features than an optical microscope. And this is because the electron microscope uh, has, you know, can see much tinier objects. Here's uh, another set of pictures taken by an electron microscope, a scanning electron microscope, again, uh, at my institute, uh, IISC. And what you're seeing here are images of small polystyrene balls, uh, small polystyrene spheres. Each one of them is a, is a few hundreds of nanometers in diameter. And you can see that you can see them quite clearly in these images. And what's more, you can also see the gaps between them. So this particular electron microscope actually has a resolution to even see gaps between these balls. Um, and if you look at what the size of the gap of these gaps are, they're about you know, 50 nanometers or 0 0.05 microns. And so the resolution of the scanning electron microscope is at least that much, which is much better than that of an optical microscope. In fact, if you work harder, uh, you can actually push down the resolution to something that's much lower to about a nanometer or so using a scanning electron microscope. So that's of course very impressive, but it's still not good enough to see atoms, which are smaller, uh, which as I told you are you know, about an angstrom or so in size. So how do you do that? So this is where we are going to invoke another principle of quantum mechanics, again, involving electrons. And the basis of this principle is also there in a 12 standard textbook. And this has to do with how electrons and metals behave. Okay. So what your 12 standard textbook tells you is that if you look at the electrons in a metal, and if you want to remove an electron from the metal, then you have to give it a certain amount of energy because the metal is trying to pull it back. And in fact, the electron has a much lower potential energy inside a metal than it would have outside. And so you have to give it a certain amount of energy to pull it out of the metal. Um, and that amount of energy is called the work function. It's a bit like the concept of escape velocity when you're trying to you know, uh, eject something from the earth and the earth is trying to pull it back. So you need to give it a certain minimum velocity to be able to eject it from the earth. So this is similar. Okay. Now, something very interesting happens when if instead of having just a single piece of metal, you actually have two pieces of metal, which you bring very close to one another. So imagine that I have one piece of metal here, another piece of metal here, and I'm bringing them quite close to one another so that the separation between them is L. So now if you look at what the electrons would like to do, the electrons would like to be either in this metal or in that metal. So they have a low potential energy, regardless of whether they're here or here. But if they're somewhere in between, then of course there's no metal and they have a higher potential energy. Now here's the interesting thing that comes from quantum mechanics, that in a situation like this, if you wanted to remove the electron from metal one and put it in metal two, then you don't actually need to supply so much energy to the electron. It doesn't have to go over this energy barrier. Even if the energy that you give this electron is less than this 
energy barrier, it can still go from metal one to metal two. And this is something that's called quantum mechanical tunneling. This is again, one of the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics. And it turns out that the electron can do this, but it doesn't necessarily have to do this. There's a certain probability associated with this happening. And that probability falls off exponentially with the separation between the metals. Put the two metals far apart, this probability of the electron going from one to the other is small, bring them close, it's larger, and it depends exponentially on that distance. And of course, because these electrons are charged, when they go from one metal to another metal, they carry a certain amount of current. And so the principle of microscopy that I'm going to talk to you about in the remaining you know, five or six minutes that I have, you really uses this quantum mechanical principle. And this kind of microscope is called a scanning tunneling microscope. And the idea is that if you want to image the atoms of a certain metal, then you bring another metal very close to it. And this other metal is shaped in this way, in the form of a tip. You know, it has a very sharp apex. And because the current between them, which you're driving through this battery, is exponentially small in the distance between these two metals, it doesn't matter how much current is coming from the other parts of this metallic tip. What really matters, because those the amount of current is going to be rather small, what really matters is how much current is coming from the apex of this tip. Everything else is irrelevant. And this apex can actually be made rather small. Okay, And this tip can be brought very close to this metallic surface. So as you move along this metallic surface, you can actually image these metallic atoms by seeing whether or not there's a current flowing. Um, so if, let's say, the tip was directly on top of a metal atom, then, of course, there'd be a current flowing uh, because there's you know, this tunneling that I described. If you move the tip to a place which is between, which is you know, in a gap between two metallic atoms, then there's no current that's flowing because the current has nowhere to go. So this way, depending on whether or not you actually have a current in the circuit, you can tell whether there's a metallic atom or not. And this way, you can image atoms. OK, so let me show you uh, some pictures. But before that, I just want to tell you very quickly that it's not very difficult making these tips, that you can actually make these tips just using a simple metal wire and a wire cutter. And you can actually get a tip which is reasonably sharp for you to be able to do this. You can also treat the tip with chemicals so that it becomes even sharper. There are also ways in which you can move these tips very close to the surface of a metal for tunneling to happen. So all of that technology exists, which makes this kind of tunneling microscopy possible. OK, so here are some pictures. Uh, now that I want to show you obtained again in my Institute of IISC. And so what you're seeing are these scanning tunneling microscope images of atoms of graphite, which are just carbon atoms on the surface of graphite. And so if you look at this image here, forget about the other images, its width is about 10 angstroms and its height is about 11 angstroms. And within this, you can see all of these balls, these blobs, and each one of those is a carbon atom. So in this image using obtained using a scanning tunneling microscope, you can actually see individual atoms. This was actually obtained using a fairly fancy scanning tunneling microscope. You can also obtain similar images using simpler scanning tunneling microscopes, including one that was actually made in RRI about 25 years ago. Uh, this is the picture of that STM. And this is the kind of image that was obtained using it, which is not very different from what you get using this fancier uh, scanning tunneling microscope. Okay, but that's the but the essential principle is this principle of tunneling. Okay, so in the remaining, according to my clock, about three minutes that I have, let me quickly tell you whether you can see electrons with an STM. So I've shown you that you can see atoms using a scanning tunneling microscope. Can you see electrons using electrons? So the point is that, of course, electrons are point particles. So they don't have a size like atoms do. And so you can't image them individually. But it turns out that under certain conditions, you can actually image collections of these electrons, and especially patterns that are formed in collections of these electrons. Okay, And so electrons form interesting states of matter, uh, usually under extreme conditions. And these states of matter have some patterns which you can image using an STM. But the point is that in order to see that, your STM itself has to be able to operate, has to be, you know, has to be able to operate under these extreme conditions. And so you need to augment the STM with various uh, uh, <clears throat> capabilities, like being able to go to very low temperatures or high magnetic fields. And that's the reason you have fancy STMs, such as this one, which is from a lab in TIFR Mumbai. And this is 
uh, another one which is from a lab in my institute of IIC Bangalore. And these are sort of fancy STMs that you can use to uh, image these patterns inside um, formed by electrons. So let me just show you a couple of these patterns and then I'll end. So one thing is that electrons in a metal, they you know, form a fluid and the flow of this fluid is responsible for electrical current. So when a metal carries electrical current, it's really like this fluid of electrons that's flowing, that's the current. Now at very low temperatures, these metals, many metals can actually become superconductors and this electron fluid can flow with absolutely no resistance. I mean, that's the property of a superconductor. But it turns out that inside a superconductor, you can actually have whirlpools in this electron fluid. You can have these uh, things which look like whirlpools, which are called vortices. And these are very important to the physics of um, a, a superconductor. And it turns out that these vortices can be imaged using a scanning tunneling microscope. So this is uh, an image of such vortices uh, obtained uh, in a lab in TIFR Mumbai. And this image was actually obtained at a very, very low temperature at 350 millikelvin. So that's 0.35 degrees centigrade about abs above absolute zero. So these microscopes can operate under such conditions. Um, one more thing quickly is that you know, you could, under certain conditions, these electrons can also form solids, not just liquids. Um, and, and such a solid is called a Wigner crystal. And it turns out that even that can be imaged. The solid, which is made up of electrons, can actually be imaged using a scanning tunneling microscope. And this was done very recently. These are sort of these images um, of uh, the electrons. These balls that you see here are clumps of electrons. And these can be imaged using a scanning tunneling microscope. And this was done quite recently. Um, okay, so let me just, I just have this slide and one more slide and I'll end. So I've shown you different images. So for instance, an image of, of carbon atoms on the surface of graphite, these vortices in a superconductor, these clumps of electrons in a solid of electrons. And so if I just show you the images, you can ask, well, how do you tell which is which just from looking at the images? It turns out that you can't do that. You need some more information about the system, you know, what exactly it is that you put inside your microscope, some, some other, you know, whether it's carbon atoms or a superconductor or something, or some information like that. But even if you don't have that information, it turns out that you can get some information by taking these images under different circumstances. For instance, changing the voltage that you're using to drive a current or changing the temperature uh, and seeing what happens to the image. And this is something that's done routinely. It's called scanning tunneling spectroscopy. And this is really an important uh, tool in this kind of um, science. So this is my last slide. So I hope that what I've been able to tell you in this much time is that Electron microscopy is an extremely powerful way of imaging tiny objects, and it gives you a much higher resolution than, than optical microscopy. It works completely on the principles of quantum mechanics, allows you to see individual atoms, okay? And it's also one of the most important techniques in the field of nanotechnology. Um, that, you know, in fact, the field of nanotechnology was really kickstarted by the development of these kinds of microscopes. Um, and so it really is, you know, like a workhorse technique. And um, there's a lot of interesting and exciting research being done in this field in India and around the world. Okay, so thank you very much and apologies for going a little bit over time. Thanks a lot, Shubhato, for this very nice uh, introduction and very nice talk on electrons and atoms. So uh, we can have a few questions now. So does anyone have any questions at this stage? Okay. Do you see any raised hands? Yeah, Devesh, please go on. Yeah, actually, I can't see you because yeah, I. Evening, professor. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask that in quantum physics that you're talking about, like you said about seeing the electrons. So my main question was that: Is there any main motivation to the students given in India to pursue research, especially in the field of quantum mechanics or any other such related fields? Okay. So, so your your question is um, about why one should even do research on quantum mechanics. Is that your question? No, like. It's not about the why it should be done, but is there any motivation for which it is done? Well, okay, I guess the, the motivation in general is to, among other things, okay, so, so, so the, you know, the motivation is of two kinds. One, of course, is that it's technologically very important, right? So we know that all electronics is getting smaller and smaller. Your cell phones are, you know, getting more and more packed with circuits. 
as um, almost any other electronic uh, gadget. And so what's going to happen is that, you know, very soon electronic, the components of the electronic circuits are going to become the size of atoms and molecules. And then in order to even develop electronics, it's absolutely inevitable that you have to worry about quantum mechanics because the laws that govern atoms and molecules are quantum mechanical. So from a technological point of view, of course, you have to worry about uh, quantum mechanics and uh, you know what it uh, and and how you could image things on on such small scales. And then, of course, there's you know the fundamental curiosity of understanding um, what what matter does at the smallest uh, scales of you know at, at very small scales of length and also at very low temperatures, for instance, uh, or high magnetic fields. And all of this requires um, uh, basically thinking of things in terms of quantum mechanics. So that's the motivation. So I mean, that... to say like it's because of the compaction of the technology that we're having in practical world and in theoretical world to know the nature of the universe. And right. I mean, okay, that, 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 that's too, uh, you know, if you really want to make a list of motivations, yeah, that would be too, uh, you know, motivations. Oh, on okay. That list. okay, sir. Yeah. So we have Ananya Prabhuram. Hello. Um, so I just had um, a small question about whatever you spoke. So I just wanted to know if X-ray crystallography uses almost the same principle as the microscope that you're talking about. Okay, that's a good question. So the point is that X-ray crystallography actually doesn't use exactly the same principle. What X-ray crystallography does is it gives you an image which is really a diffraction pattern. And then you have to back out what the actual arrangement of atoms or molecules or whatever it was, which gave you the diffraction pattern is from the diffraction pattern. It's like, you know, when in a lab, if you have a diffraction grating and you send light through it and somebody gives you an image of the diffraction pattern, can you get the, you know, can you, can you make an image of the grating from the diffraction pattern? Now, this kind of thing works if you actually have a nice grating. For instance, in the case of X-ray crystallography, if your atoms are nicely arranged in some periodic arrangement, then you can do this. You get a nice diffraction pattern from which you can back out the arrangement of the atoms. But on the other hand, if your atoms are not arranged in such a nice way, then of course, X-ray crystallography or X-ray diffraction doesn't work because you get a very smudged diffraction pattern from which you can get nothing. But the kind of microscopy that I told you about is something which doesn't really care about how the atoms are arranged. They could be arranged in some nice periodic way. They could be arranged in some completely random way. There could just be a very handful of them. But this kind of imaging, this kind of microscopy will let you see those atoms. X-ray crystallography will not, or X-ray diffraction will not let you see them. So right. does that answer so your question? Yeah, sort of. But is it possible to sort of uh, look at graphite through X-ray crystallography? Because it does have sort of sheets as part of it. So well, does that oh, work? Right. Okay. So the thing, so you're asking, can you actually get an image of graphite through uh, X-ray crystallography? And yes, you can. Um, so in this particular case, of course, you know, if you, if you did X-ray crystallography on graphite, then what would happen is that you would actually get an image of a three-dimensional piece of graphite. Whereas the image that I showed you was not of the entire three-dimensional piece of graphite, it was actually of the surface of graphite. So scanning tunneling microscopy is something which gives you um, information about the surface. X-ray crystallography, where you can do it, typically will give you image, will give you an image of the whole three-dimensional object from which you can't easily figure out what's happening on the surface. So if for some reason you wanted surface images, then again, X-ray crystallography is not you know, particularly useful. All right, thanks a lot. So we'll have one last question now, and then in the end, we can have a little bit more of Q&A, but then for Shubhrutu now, one last question before yeah. we move on to the next speaker. So that is uh, Tanmay. Uh, yes, so, uh, like in the scanning uh, microscopy, they have taken it uh, like to the ex extremes, like in extreme conditions, and you have got one of the best images. So like, what is the next step? Like, uh, okay. is there any... Right. Okay, so the thing is that, as I mentioned to you, that it's not just a question of taking images with the scanning tunneling microscope. That's one of the things that it does. The other thing which you can do is, you know, if you change the voltage or the operating conditions, take images at, you know, in different conditions, put them together, then you can get um, a lot more information about the kind of system that you're imaging. Is it a superconductor? Is it a metal? Is it something like, you know, this clumps of electrons or, or even is it a magnet? 
And so a lot of the frontier direction of research in scanning tunnel microscopy is uh, about expanding sort of these abilities of scanning tunneling microscopes, um, being able to turn more knobs in some sense, get images under different conditions, uh, um, you know, uh, like uh, with, you know, by changing a different number of parameters, putting those images together and getting more information about the system that you're imaging rather than using it to just take pictures. So that is sort of the frontier direction. Uh, okay, so like better understanding the material that you're looking for. Right, better understanding the material and also be able to manipulate the material. You can actually through the, you know, by, with the electrons that you're sending, at times also make changes to the material, um, assuming that the material allows you to do that. So you can actually use scanning tunneling microscopy to even make patterns and structures in a material in a certain way. Thank you. Which I didn't talk about. Okay, so I think uh, we will take other questions in the end because we want to move ahead with the next speaker. So Himanshu, kindly ask your question at the end of the session when we'll have another Q&A. So thank you very much, Shubrato, once again. So we move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor uh, Subrat Raju from ICTS Bangalore. And the topic is the strange behavior of quantum information in quantum gravity. So uh, Subrat, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen first. Uh, you see this? Yes, we see it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, so uh, uh, thank you very much, first of all, Urbushi, for uh, inviting me and for organizing this. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, so, I'm going to tell you about uh, you know the strange behavior. Uh, the strange title of mine talks about the strange behavior of uh, quantum information in quantum gravity. Uh, so, I'm going to try and tell you a story in in ten minutes, and hopefully, I'll convey some of the interest and excitement. Uh, in this field that uh, you know we've seen recently. So before I start telling you about you know all these things in quantum gravity, uh, let me just uh, remind you of something uh, very simple that was in fact already discussed at the uh, at the beginning of uh, this session when uh, most of you hadn't joined, and uh, that's uh, one of the most fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, which uh, goes by. Uh, the name of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And this is a photograph of the person Heisenberg. Uh, and uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that uh, quantum mechanics is very different in a way uh, from you know, our mundane experience. You know, in our mundane experience, uh, you can say I'm holding up some cup and you know, I know the cup is here and I know its velocity or its momentum is zero. Uh, but it turns out that uh, you know, that's not something one can do at the quantum at the quantum mechanical scale. And in fact, you know, it, it turns out that if you look at the uncertainty in the position of some particle and the uncertainty in the momentum of some particle, the product of those is bounded below by some fundamental constant called H bar. So you could try and make, you know, the momentum of a particle very precise, but then its position would become very imprecise and vice versa. So for instance, uh, you know, this is a picture. Uh, uh, so you, the uncertainty principle is often phrased in terms of momentum, but in fact, you know, as you know, uh, momentum often comes with energy. So I'm going to play a little fast and loose and talk about energy and position. Uh, so, you know, if you think of some particle which has a fixed energy, so you know the energy very well. So like you see on the right-hand side. Uh, then if you know the energy very well, it turns out that, you know, the particle is almost completely delocalized in position space. So this is an example of how it might be, you know, it might be here or it might be here or it might be here or it might be here. So it becomes like a, a wave in, in position space. This is what was being asked earlier. So if you knew the, the energy precisely, then the particle becomes like a wave. It just spreads out everywhere. So at first you might start worrying that uh, this property of quantum mechanics uh, you know, prevents you even from having, you know, localized particles after all, but, you know, we are localized, you know, you guys are sitting somewhere else, I'm sitting here, and there is some sense in which we can localize particles in spite of this uncertainty principle. And one of the principles that comes into play and that helps us a lot is another very funny aspect of quantum mechanics. Uh, which is what is called the principle of superposition. You know, this goes by the name sometimes of Schrodinger's cat, which is also on the poster uh, of this session. And it tells you that, you know, in quantum mechanics, the, you know, you, you don't have to consider one state. It might be that you have this cat 
and this cat is in a superposition of being alive or being dead. And what that really means is if you measure the cat, then you know, with some probability half, you find the cat is alive and happy. And with some probability half, you find that the cat is dead. Okay? But in any case, uh, you know, quantum mechanics treats reality in some sense very differently from our mundane notions of reality in that you can consider these sums of states. So you can say, you know, here is one state and I will add to it another state. And by doing that, you know, you can construct states which have very different properties from the initial states that you started with. So that actually helps us a lot when we are trying to localize particles and trying to, in, in spite of the uncertainty principle. So the way that that works is, you know, remember I said in the beginning that if you take one particle which has some given energy, everything on the left is some energy spectrum, then that corresponds to something that's completely delocalized in position space. But, you know, just like we can consider Schrodinger cat states for cat, I mean, we can't really construct Schrodinger cat states for cats, but just like we can consider for some simple systems, these kinds of Schrodinger cat states, you can play the same game with particles and you can say, well, you know, what if I don't make the energy of the particle definite, but instead I give you a particle which has a probability of having one energy and then maybe it has a similar pro or different probability of having a different energy, which is the energy here. And then it also has some probability of having a third different energy and so on. And in fact, if you consider, uh, you know, a very complicated superposition, you have to consider an infinite superposition. It turns out that you can create states which in position space are localized in that the particle in position space now looks like it is, you know, it has some probability of being here at this spot, but no probability of being outside some region. So in fact, you and I and most of us are in some approximately in states of this kind, where we are superpositions of having you know, different kinds of energies. And as a result, you know, we have a strong probability of being in one location and not being you know, delocalized everywhere in the universe. So this is the way we usually localize states in quantum mechanics. And this is in fact also the way usually states, you know, quantum information is localized. And you know, it's in fact not very different in the end from the way we usually think of information being localized in that, you know, there's some particle which is here and to see if it is there or not, you know, you have to go there and, and visit it. You can't determine whether it's there or not by making some measurements around this region. Okay, so now I want to tell you about how, you know, how quantum gravity changes this thing. Okay, so let me remind you of something very fundamental about gravity, which is also something that perhaps some of you have learned and maybe some of you have not, which is called the Gauss law. So the Gauss law tells you that gravity is a very unusual, uh, you know, unusual kind of force in that if you have some object like this blue ball, which is sitting here, and uh, you, know, you, you make observations on this pink sphere, the pink sphere doesn't actually have to exist, but let's say you go very far away and you try to measure the force that some particle feels as a result of this ball here and here and here. And if you add that up, you can in fact determine the mass of the ball without ever visiting the ball. Okay, so that's called the Gauss law. It tells you that you know, the total flux of the gravitational field at a distance uh, is given by the mass that lives in the center. Not all forces are of this kind. Some forces are of this kind, uh, but gravity is, is of this kind. Now the Gauss law is actually very important. It's very important because I'm sure you've read in your textbooks uh, that you know, we know the mass of the sun, right? We know that the sun has a mass of two into 10 to the power 30 kg. How do we know the mass of the sun? Right? None of us has actually been to the sun. We, in fact, do live on this small blue ball, which is like Earth, which is far away from the sun. And you know, we don't actually want to go to the sun and you know, try and uh, you know, take different samples and see what the density is. Right? So we, we know the mass of the sun. And the way we know the mass of the sun is really through the Gauss law, you know, because we know how the sun attracts other planets. And by doing that, you know, we can determine the mass of the sun. So the Gauss law is really something which is important in learning about the universe around us. It's, it's what we use to determine the mass of the sun or the mass of the black hole in the center of the galaxy or you know, ma many things. Whenever we know the mass, we often know it uh, through the Gauss law. Okay, so how is this relevant to the story that I was telling you about quantum information? So the point is that you know, if you think of uh, one of these particles, which I said in the beginning, if it had a sharply peaked energy, would look like this wave in, in position space. You know, when you start thinking of what happens if you have both the effects of quantum mechanics and gravity, 
uh, which is what the study of quantum gravity is about. It's about trying to combine uh, the effects both of quantum mechanics and of gravity. Then you find that this particle, which has some fixed you know, energy, not only does it look like some, some wave which is delocalized in position, uh, what is more, it also has to have some gravitational tail. It has to have some gravitational field because even in quantum mechanics, we have to satisfy the Gauss law. So we find that, you know, when you have a certain energy, not only is there some effect due to the uncertainty principle, which I was explaining in the beginning, there is also an effect due to the Gauss law, which tells you that you, know, you produce a gravitational field, which extends far out, you know, just like the gravitational field of the sun extends far out. And so the way this is important is that if you try now to construct these Schrodinger cat states, uh, where you know I tried to construct one state and you know I I, I tried to uh, I tried to combine it with with another state uh, of a different energy and then combine it with a third state of a third different energy and so on, you find that this no longer succeeds in localizing an excitation. And the reason is that even though you know you took your particle and you added to it these different energies you know so as to try and localize the particle there was also a gravitational field of the particle which is i'm showing in this cartoon on the right hand side which extends far away and even you know if you try and ensure that this particle is well localized this gravitational field is not localized and always carries information about the state of the particle so this is a very interesting effect. And in fact, by studying this effect uh, in, in Bangalore at ICTS and with many collaborators in many parts of the world, uh, one can in fact show that, you know, if you make observations far away at infinity, you can in fact completely determine the form of the particle, even without actually visiting the particle. Okay? So here's a cartoon that shows that. So if you look at, at ordinary theories, you know, as I said, you could prepare a state which had some excitation or some particle that lived in some region. And so that outside this region, you know, things looked exactly, you know, you, you had no idea that there was an excitation inside this region. And what is more, we can change the form of this, this particle, you know, I can put two particles or, you know, instead of having a particle which has, or having some excitation which has this shape, I can make an excitation which has this shape. I can change the form of this excitation inside some region. So you see inside this white boundary while keeping everything outside unchanged. So if you had some observers outside here who wanted to know what the excitation inside was, they couldn't do it without actually visiting this region and finding out what is happening. On the other hand, it turns out that in gravity, what happens is very different. First, if you try to put some excitation in some region, you're forced to have tails that go out to infinity but in quantum gravity, and it's important that this is an effect that happens only when you consider the effects both of quantum mechanics and of gravity, it turns out that these tails far away are in one-to-one -one correspondence with this form of the excitation inside. So, you know, uh, if you try to change, you know, some, something inside some bounded region or inside some, some region, uh, you're forced also to change the form of these tails far away. And so quantum information can't really strictly be localized in gravity as it can be in other theories. Now I should hasten to add that this is a very weak effect. You know, it's not like, you know, people who actually study quantum information like the other speakers on the panel uh, will need to worry about this effect. And the reason they don't need to worry about this effect is because the effects of quantum gravity are very, very small. But nevertheless, in principle, there is an extremely, you know, different method in which gravity, or different manner in which gravity localizes or fails to localize information than the way ordinary theories do. Here is a picture to make it even more dramatic. You know, imagine that we could actually measure the effects of quantum gravity, which is beyond our current technological ability. Then in an ordinary theory, you know, imagine I had this red ellipsoidal ball here and I had a lot of detectors on this globe. If I had a lot of detectors, you know, the advanced version of the scanning tunneling microscope that Subrato spoke about, you know, maybe I had these gravitational uh, microscopes which could determine uh, all the effects of quantum gravity, then I could tell even without, you know, visiting this region of the ball, I could determine exactly its size and its shape. You know, you could do that also in an ordinary theory, but you would have to wait at least for light to emerge from the ball in order to be able to do that. Uh, but in a theory of gravity, uh, what this effect I previously described tells you 
is that if you did have this advanced technology, which was able to measure small quantum gravity fluctuations, then you would be able to determine everything at all points of time, and you could never hide information from these detectors outside, which is something which is very surprising and very unusual, of course. Let me tell you one, one, you know, one, uh, one effect that uh, an interesting consequence of this, uh, which has to do with black holes and a very old problem uh, to do with black holes, which uh, this has an important bearing on. So, you know, um, perhaps some of you have heard that, um, uh, have heard of uh, Stephen Hawking, who was a famous physicist. And one of uh, the reasons he was famous is that he, he argued that if you have black holes, so this is my cartoon of a black hole, then these black holes uh, in quantum mechanics are not exactly black, but rather they, they emit some radiation. This is my, this yellow ring is my cartoon of the radiation being emitted from black holes. And what is more, Hawking argued that the radiation that emerges from black holes is free of what, you know, what initially went into the black hole. And this led him to what is called the information paradox, which is the following story. Imagine that you have some star, maybe our sun or a star slightly bigger than our sun. And, uh, you know, it collapses to form a black hole of this kind. Then if one were to exactly believe Hawking's calculation, it would suggest that, you know, this black hole left to itself after a very long time will eventually evaporate, but it will evaporate into some, you know, gas of radiation, uh, which has no information about the initial star. And this tells you that the, you know, the final state that you get here is not reversible in that you can't determine, you know, what the initial state of the system was. And this is a very unusual property. You know, all of you know, even from, from class eight physics that, you know, in physics, one of the rules is that if you're told the state of a system at one point of time, you can not only predict the future, but you can retrodict the past. So, you know, if I give you, if I tell you there's a bullet which is going at this speed at some point of time, I can tell you where it will land, but I can also tell you where it came from. Can people in ballistics really do this? You know, they look at a bullet and they try and back calculate where it came from. So you can use physics to predict or to retrodict and Hawking suggested that, you know, maybe in black holes, it wouldn't be like this. In fact, it turns out that this effect that I just described about the unusual localization of quantum information in gravity was the key effect that, that Hawking overlooked. And, uh, you know, if one, if one uh, you know, if one accounts for this effect, of course, I mean, he overlooked in that this effect wasn't analyzed and known at that time. But if one accounts for this effect, uh, then one finds that you know information about what made up the black hole is always available outside, and it resolves this very old problem uh, that you know has has been an important problem in the study of gravity. Uh, so I, you know this is something which is an I think an interesting development in in many ways. It tells us something interesting, uh, in principle interesting about information and gravity, and also has a bearing on on problems that that you know were, were old and important problems in quantum gravity. Uh, so let me stop here. I think I went a little over time and I can uh, take a few questions. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Subrat. That was a very exciting talk. So we can have one or two questions now. Any raised hands? Mm -hmm. Devesh, please go ahead. You said that how a uh, sun just collapsed and becomes a black hole and we can get to know about from what it was made of. Like if a sun collapses, it becomes a black hole. So there is a region from where we can get to know that how it was formed. Was that correct? Like the last part you said? Uh, yeah, I didn't hear the question correctly, but you said observers outside the black hole could determine how it was formed. Is yeah. that, was that Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I should emphasize once again that these are, you know, a lot of these questions are in principle questions, including the information paradox, because the effects of quantum gravity are very weak. So, you know, a real black hole emits with a temperature of 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin ne effectively never evaporates. Okay? But in, you know, this is an important in principle question for the consistency of the theory. And indeed, in principle, the answer is that the resolution to this is that if you have a black hole and the black hole, you know, and you make careful enough measurements in the region surrounding the black hole, uh, then you can determine uh, how the black hole was formed. Yeah, but my question is like, supposing if a black hole is present, so it could attract matter around it, and the region won't be without any matter around the black hole. So wouldn't the matter inevitably fuse together and we won't be able to get its pure state? So should the measurement be made, like the simulation should be made, just when the black hole was formed or it could be even done when other matters came and fused together and formed the ring around the black hole that we usually see and call that black hole could be visible. 
sorry, I, I, and the audio is a little poor. I, I wasn't able to understand the question. Uh, did you say, sorry, did you understand what was it? Could you repeat? I, I didn't. Can I repeat what I asked? Yeah, or maybe, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, or maybe if I'm taking the other question, if you could so type Devish, it in the chat. Type it, yeah, yeah, type it yeah, in sure. the chat. Yeah, sure. yeah. I think the audio so is a little poor. So maybe I can take the other question and I can yeah. answer your question. So after. we'll go on to Karthik then. Devish, kindly chat, write your question in the chat. Karthik Shana. Sir, uh, actually, uh, to what level does gravity actually play a role in quantum mechanics? To what level does gravity uh, actually play? Uh, yeah, so because as far as I know, it is one of the weakest fundamental forces. So, uh, like they usually ignore gravity uh, when other forces are there, like electricity. So, like, to what level? Okay, correct. Uh, this is correct that the effects of quantum gravity are are very weak and so you know um, uh, in in most ordinary experiments you do not need to worry about quantum gravity on the other hand you know quantum gravity is important for some other questions you know let's say we wanted to ask what happened in the very early stages of the universe uh, then at that time the effects of both quantum mechanics and of gravity would be important so if you wanted to ask questions of that kind, or you know, what would happen if if you if you you know if you were to make a black hole that was much smaller than a than a, a, a solar-sized black hole that did really evaporate? So if you wanted to ask questions of that kind, uh, then uh, questions about quantum gravity would be important to answer. So it's true, you're right, that in ordinary experiments it's not something uh, that's important, uh, but it is a, a question that's important for this reason. It's also a question that's theoretically a very challenging question because you know. Uh, one of the challenges in in many you know in many parts of physics often uh, the key was to get external consistency you know you could write down many theories and you had to check which one was the right one uh, on the other hand in in quantum gravity it turns out it's very challenging even to get internal consistency in that it's very challenging even to get a single theory that doesn't suffer from just internal inconsistencies from paradoxes like the paradox i just described and so, you know, it's, a, it's just very challenging for theorists to try and understand, you know, uh, how to construct a, a consistent theory of quantum gravity. And that's uh, some of what drives a lot of the effort. But eventually, you know, we do think it is important because it should be important for asking very fundamental questions we'd like to ask about nature, such as these conditions of what happens in extreme circumstances, like in the beginning of the universe. Thank you. So, Subrat, uh, I have asked Shopam to also type his question in the chat window. So, there'll be two questions in the chat window. Could you please answer them there? Because then we can move on to the next speaker sure. and, and keep time sure. a little bit. So, thanks should I a lot. Answer Devesh's question, or should I not? Should I? Should I type? Devesh it? has just uh, typed it, so you can you can type it uh, as well. And in you the end, if there is need, then we can have a you know Q and A. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay so we you. will. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Subrat. So we will move on then uh, to the third uh, talk which is by uh, Professor Rajamani Vijay Raghavan from uh, TIFR Mumbai. And he's going to talk to us about introduction to quantum computers. Vijay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, that floor is yours, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot Urbashi for uh, inviting me and uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Ubushi, is uh, audio and video okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. All right. So let's get started. Um, in this very short presentation, I hope to give you a flavor of uh, what quantum computers are and why they are exciting and uh, what's going on around the world and in India in this uh, field as well. Okay. So what you see on the screen is um, a picture of a relatively small molecule. And it's actually the molecule corresponding to a medicine, aspirin, which I'm sure some of you have heard about. And it's relatively simple in the sense of, you know, the number of atoms it has. So it has about nine carbon atoms, uh, eight hydrogen atoms, and four oxygen atoms. And since we're talking about quantum things today, you know that atoms and molecules, they follow the laws of quantum physics. And there are equations to understand uh, these laws and, and uh, understand how a quantum system will behave. But it turns out that when you try to solve these equations on a regular computer, like the kinds we use today, uh, or even the most powerful supercomputers uh, which we have, which are all of the same type, just bigger uh, and more powerful, that even a simple problem like this 
of understanding the full quantum mechanical properties is very, very difficult and almost impossible to solve. And this has to do with how quantum mechanical equations behave. And that's closely connected to how quantum computers are different than uh, everyday computers. And we will try to understand that. Okay, so before we go to uh, quantum computers itself, we need to understand a little bit about our modern day current computers, which we now call classical computers. Okay. Now, whenever we think about computing, we know we are talking about numbers. Now in our usual calculation, when we do things by hand, uh, uh, we use uh, the so-called the decimal number system, which has uh, 10 digits from zero all the way up to nine. And you can do various things. You can add, subtract, multiply, and you can do all kinds of calculations using these numbers. But it turns out that when machines want to work with numbers, it is better for them if they only use a number system which has only two digits. Okay, This is basically what is also called the binary system. I'm sure some of you have come across this. And it's just because it's easier for a machine to represent only two numbers, but it doesn't stop you from doing all the things you were doing before. You can still add, subtract. There is a mapping from how to go from, say, decimal to binary and binary to decimal. And when you, uh, when you have machines which are trying to play with these uh, binary digits, you have to store them in some particular form, and that depends on how it is actually stored. So for example, if you have a CD or a DVD drive, uh, these same numbers are stored in a very specific way. So here is an image of what actually looks, uh, it looks like if you zoom into a CD or DVD, there are these different kinds of marks here. And these different marks represent the two different states which is zero and one or the two different numbers. And in different systems like your computers or your uh, smartphones, you represent these numbers in different ways using voltages and currents. And this way of doing computation has been very successful and it's been tremendously um, um, transformative in how we uh, do work today, do scientific research, type letters, write emails, and even this very Zoom session, it's all enabled by this fantastic technology which is based on representing numbers uh, in, in this binary form and manipulating it. Yet, despite all of this progress, the kind of problem I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, which is you know, trying to understand the full quantum mechanical properties of a simple molecule, it becomes very, very hard to run those kind of calculations in modern day, even the most powerful modern day computers. So now we try to see why that is. So when we talk about quantum, we have to sort of, typically we think about the atomic world, right? And we already in the last two talks, you've had some introduction to this idea. Here's a very simplistic picture, which is often introduced in uh, high school that, you know, you have an atom has a nucleus in the center and there are these electrons going around in orbits. And some of you I'm sure are familiar with this idea that this picture is only approximate. We cannot really tell what the orbits of these electrons are. And it's more of a, a, a cloud where these electrons can be found, right? Now, one particular uh, property uh, in quantum mechanics the electron also has is called spin. And this spin uh, makes it behave like a magnet or like a bar magnet, okay? So which means it has a North Pole and a South Pole. And we can do something interesting. We can say that if the electron has um, a magnet which is pointing in one direction, which means that the North and the South Pole aligned in one way, I could just call it zero. And if it is pointing in the opposite direction, I could call it as one. So till now, we haven't really done very, uh, anything different than what uh, I showed, told you earlier about how numbers are stored uh, by using different states. Now, because the electron spin is a quantum mechanical object, there's actually many more possibilities. And one way of thinking about these possibilities is to imagine like a globe. Now in this globe, I'm going to mark the two points, the North Pole and the South Pole as shown here as these two original points, zero and one. So these were the, the states corresponding to the standard way of storing information. But what a quantum spin allows you to do is to actually have uh, states which can be represented by other points on the sphere. So for example, if you have a point which is say on the equator, this is represented by a state which is called a superposition state as Sovrath also mentioned in his previous talk, where you can say that this system is both zero and one at the same time. Now this is one very strange thing. And if you're on the equator, it has equal probability of being in zero or one when measured, but all other points, the closer you get to one of the poles, the probability of that state increases and vice versa. 
So you can see that there are now an infinite number of possibilities for storing these states. And that is a new aspect of storing information in quantum systems. And such a system is now called a quantum bit or a qubit. Now, the other uh, aspect is that even though there are infinite ways of storing, uh, creating these states, when you detect, when you try to measure the system, you still only get one of these two possible answers. That is, is the magnet pointing in one direction or the other, or is the qubit in state zero or one? Now, let's see what happens when we start putting more of these qubits together in a system which we would call a quantum computer. Now, when you have one qubit, just like I mentioned now, you have two possibilities zero and one. And the new thing was that this system can be in both of these states at the same time. Now we go to two qubits. Now there are, you know, if you think in terms of the conventional binary way, there are now four possibilities, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. But the new thing in quantum mechanics or in quantum system is that now you can prepare the system where all of these four possibilities exist at the same time. So it's a superposition of four states and you can do that fairly straightforwardly. Now let's consider a slightly larger number of qubits, about 300, right? Now this is not a very large number. If you try to think about how many bits are there in the memory of the smartphone you have, when you talk about a four gigabyte RAM or eight gigabyte RAM, you're talking about four billion bits, right? Compared to that, this seems like a very, very tiny number. But what is the number of combinations that is possible when you have um, 300 qubits? And that number is two to the power 300. And if you write it down, it's two followed by 90 zeros. So it's an enormous number. In fact, this number is so big that it corresponds to roughly the number of atoms in the visible universe. And the new thing again here is that this quantum system can now be prepared in a state where all of these states exist at the same time. And it's this ability to manipulate this very large phase space is what gives quantum computers completely new powers, which we could not do with conventional um, computers. And it's also precisely for the same reason why when you try to solve quantum mechanical equations on a regular computer, you just cannot do it because you have to keep track of so many uh, states and that's just not enough memory or computing power, even in the most powerful supercomputers. In fact, beyond about 50 qubits, it becomes very, very uh, next to impossible to model them on a, even the most powerful supercomputers. So what can you do with these kind of machines? So here's a picture of a book, which I'm sure most of you are unfamiliar with. This is called a phone book or a directory. And you know, when we were growing up, these used to be in every house. These listed the phone numbers of the people in a small town or a city. And they were arranged in an alphabetically sorted way so that if somebody gives you a name, it was easy to find that uh, name in the, in the book, and then you can get their phone number. But if I give you the opposite problem, which is that if I give you a phone number and I ask you, can you find out who does this phone number belong to? Then there is really nothing efficient you can do. You just have to look through the book in a random fashion. And if you're lucky, you might find it on the first page, or if you're unlucky, you will have to, you will find it on the last page you look at. So if you take an average, roughly you have to go through half the entries in the, in the book. Uh, in the 90s, an Indian scientist by the name of Love Grover, when he was working at Bell Labs in the US, he invented a quantum algorithm, a program which run on a quantum computer of the type I described, where it can do something different. In some sense, it can actually look at all the pages simultaneously. You know, This is a very simplistic argument, but essentially that's sort of what it does. And he showed that instead of having to look at half the entries, so if you have n entries, instead of looking at n by two, you have to only look at about square root of n, right? And as n becomes larger, the difference between n by two and square root of n becomes bigger and bigger. So for very large search operations, this quantum version of the searching becomes a lot more efficient. There are many more applications involving security. The way we transact on the internet using our credit cards, they encrypt the information and the it's the uh, difficulty of a mathematical problem which actually protects the security of the information. There are quantum algorithms known which can break that security. Financial markets are inherently very unpredictable, but people are trying to use quantum computers to model the financial markets more uh, efficiently. Since quantum mechanics is about how nature works, whether it's chemistry or biology, you can use quantum computers to actually understand nature in a much more efficient way. You can model them a lot more efficiently. So whether it be protein folding or looking at new materials and even something like weather prediction 
people are trying to see how a quantum computer can actually do a better job. Okay. Now, but that is a problem, okay? Here is an image uh, which looks garbled. Now, maybe some of you here might recognize that it's actually the image of the famous actress, Marilyn Monroe, but this image looks uh, garbled because some of the bits here have changed. So typically in a regular computer, when there is an error, a zero becomes a one or a one becomes a zero, and that leads to the information getting corrupted. In a quantum computer, the situation is a lot worse because you have more than two possibilities. In fact, a, a, a state which can be represented as a point on the sphere can wander around anywhere. And, and this can happen because of various kinds of noises in the system. And if this happens after some point of time, you have completely lost the information you started with. So this is a very problematic issue which people are trying to tackle. And um, luckily, there is a technique called quantum error correction, which allows you to take many such qubits, which are all behaving badly in the sense that they're all doing some kind of random uh, things, but together they are able to actually retain the information uh, which was, that was originally stored. And this is extremely crucial. Our current computers do not lose information that easily, but a quantum computer can do it uh, very, very easily. And unless we solve this problem of implementing error correction, a practical computer will never be uh, possible. And this is a very important milestone. Okay. So um, this is how, uh, here are some examples of the images uh, of quantum computers. Here's actually a, a picture of an array of atoms which have been trapped or actually ions which have been trapped, which are all glowing because there's laser shining on them. That's one way of building a quantum computer. You can build circuits. This is the area I work in. These are made using superconductors. And then you can cool them down in specialized machines called dilution refrigerators. And that allows you to uh, study the quantum mechanical properties and use them as quantum bits. And there are various companies which uh, are doing this in various labs around the world, uh, including Google. I'm sure some of you have seen uh, the news about them. So um, I'll end by saying that there is also now a lot of activity, including in our lab, which is happening uh, on building these kind of quantum processes. Uh, we were one of the first labs in the country to start working on superconducting uh, based uh, qubits. Uh, there are other people now in superconducting uh, circuits uh, in Bangalore in IIC Bangalore and in other types of uh, uh, qubit designs. As I said, there are various ways you can build these systems, uh, including semiconducting and trapped ions and so on and so forth. So, and many more are also upcoming. So just to end, I want to say that this technology is going to be extremely crucial in the 21st century for the next wave of, you know, wave of developments in science and technology. And I think we are still at a stage where um, we can still make a, as a country, can make a significant impact because there are still many breakthroughs that are needed to make this technology practical. And those can happen in India. And this is sort of the idea behind uh, what's called the National Mission on Quantum Technology and Applications, which the government has been planning for the last couple of years and is supposed to start soon. And this will really push the limits of the research and technology which is happening in the country at this point. And hopefully some of you in the future will participate in these activities. Thank you, and I'll take some questions. Thanks a lot, Vijay, for this very nice overview on quantum computers. So uh, the floor is open for questions. So. Uh, do I see raised hands? I do not see raised hands as of now. Questions, comments from the students or are they? Okay, so Tanmay, Tanmay Tekle. Uh, so my question was, uh, what exactly are qubits made of? Uh, yeah, thank you Tanmay. Um, so as I was showing you, qubits can actually be made of different kinds of things. Uh, one is that because we are trying to uh, um, access systems which show quantum mechanical properties, one of the natural things to do is to work with atoms or individual ions. And this um, here, let me uh, share the screen again. So this here is actually a string of individual atoms which have been trapped in vacuum using electromagnetic fields. And then you can shine lasers onto them to manipulate their states and do the operations. This is a, actually a, a piece of uh, silicon on which you have made some patterns using aluminum, uh, which is a superconductor. So there are very many different kinds of technologies one can use to build them. Just like you, know, you have flash drives, hard drives, uh, CD drives, 
to store information. Similarly, you have different physical systems which can store quantum information. And each of them has pros and cons. Currently, these two techniques, that is the trapping of ions and the superconducting methods are at the forefront in terms of the most advanced technology, but they are still not guaranteed that they will actually reach a stage. So it could be a new technology in the future or a combination of these technologies. So the, the future quantum computer, which would actually really solve all these uh, fancy problems I told you about is still unknown and we will find out. Karthik Shunan. Thank you. Uh, sir, you just told it so these qubits are made of uh, atoms. So, how would you calculate the spin on them? They are basically very small uh, point objects. On them. So, how would you calculate what the spin on them? Yeah, so um, the way they calculate is by implementing um, a quantum program, but that translates into the actual physical hardware in terms of various electronic pulses. So, for the atoms, it's usually done using laser light. So what it means is that remember when you're trying to um, do any calculation in the regular computer, you first have to store that number. So that storing that number in the quantum uh, uh, picture could mean that a, a laser is shown onto the atom in a particular way. Then you shine a different laser to do a different operation, maybe to you know implement some kind of an interaction between two different atoms. So by a combination of these sequences is how a computer program actually runs on these systems. If you take the same thing to a superconducting qubit-based quantum computer, then it uses microwave signals to do these changes and run the algorithm. So eventually when a quantum computer is built, the user will actually not have to worry about these details, just like you don't worry about how your own computer is actually doing the calculation. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware that the transistors, which are bits in your modern day computers are very small. They're about 14 nanometers or even smaller uh, these days. And yet they're able to do these calculations with the help of electric and, and uh, you know, uh, current and voltage pulses. So th that's, uh, will be taken care of the overall control system of the quantum computer. But that's roughly how they will, they will do the calculation. Is it the same way uh, for electrons? Like they have a spin quantum number. Is it the same yes. way? So, as I said, um, for atoms, it's it's uh, based on lasers. For superconducting qubits, it's based on microwaves. For uh, electron spin-based computers, it's a combination of microwaves and uh, you know DC voltage and current pulses. So, the technology determines what is the best way to probe the system. So then you build the corresponding uh, um, circuits which allow you to do the manipulation and the detection. But at the higher level as a programmer, this will be completely transparent. You might just say measure qubit one, and then the system will figure out what to do in terms of sending the right signals to actually do that operation. Thank you. So we'll have one last question. The next one in the list is Ananya Prabhura. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I just checked the price of a a supercomputer and it, it it looks very costly. So is there any like way that we could change the materials of these chips and sort of make them a little more cost efficient? Um, are you talking about the cost of a supercomputer or of a quantum computer? Sorry, a quantum computer. Okay, I'm I'm actually curious to know where you found out the price of a quantum computer because uh, there are I no- I just looked it up on Google. Uh, yes, so- um, so, so the simple answer is we are not trying to make the cost of the quantum computer at this point uh, low at all. That's not the focus. Um, simply put, we don't have a truly working quantum computer at this point of time. Now, maybe if you remember the history of uh, regular computers, uh, the first computer, you know, the, what is called the ENIAC, you know, it was the size of the room. It probably cost a lot of money for that time. But then slowly as technology improved, the um, you know, things became smaller. And then when you start producing things on a large scale, uh, things become cheaper as well. We are nowhere near that stage as of now. No one is worrying about reducing the cost of quantum computers, at least to the best of my knowledge. We are first trying to get it to work. Once we understand how it works and we can get it to work properly, then all the other things will come. I will also add that unlike conventional computers where there was a big race to make them smaller and smaller and ultimately you know now you are everybody's walking around with many computers on them their watches their smartphones quantum computers need not go that way 
and they might always exist as a service uh, on a central platform and you don't need to have that quantum computer in your house in order to harness the power you can do it over the internet you know for example your alexa and google home they actually use powerful supercomputers running somewhere else in the world and it does you don't see it what you have is a very simple communicating device so quantum computers most likely will go in that kind of model and it's already happening you can today access lots of uh, quantum computers for free on the internet Okay, wow, that's so, amazing. Thanks a lot. So, so thanks for the questions. So the remaining questions, we will take them at the end of the session. So Vijay, uh, Shubhrato and Subrat, if you can hold on uh, till the end of the session, that will be nice so that we can actually at least finish on some time scale. So we have one remaining talk, which is, it's, 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 it's a new developed, new feeling for me to introduce my own talk. So I'm going to give the last talk of the session. And so that is going to be on secure quantum communication. So let me try to share my screen. So can you see my screen? Maybe Vijay can answer that for me, given that. Yes, audio. Yeah, okay. yeah audio is fine. Yeah, so thank you very much. So of course, uh, you know, um, uh, I am the last speaker for the session and I'm going to talk to you about secure quantum communications. And I already introduced myself in the beginning. I am Urbushi Sinha and I'm from the Raman Research Institute in Bangalore. This is our lab, quick lab. You can have a look at the website. So various uh, motivated people working with us. And this is how the snapshot of experiments look. So let me get a laser point. Okay, doesn't matter. So what I'm going to talk about is quantum communication. So this is yet another application of quantum mechanics. So we have heard about uh, atoms and electrons. We've heard about quantum gravity a little bit. We've heard about quantum computing. Now we go on to quantum communication in which the main quantum aspect is the key distribution problem, okay? And this is in fact the most quote unquote practical quantum technology. Whereas we heard in the last talk that, you know, in the quantum computing domain, a lot of it is still in the research level. Here also, there is a lot of research going on, but then parallelly, there are also lots of devices being built by companies worldwide. And these are actually available as products which one can buy and so on. So this is, uh, you know, more practical at the moment than uh, some of the other things which are happening in the quantum domain. So why you should worry about it? And of course, you know, you are kids of today's generation. So unlike us, I don't think, you know, when we were children, we really uh, did any of these four things that is listed here, buy things with credit card or do online banking. I mean, voting, I suppose you're still not allowed. But then having said that, online is something which is very common these days. And in fact, we are speaking to you online. So all these things, you know, these four examples that have taken or, you know, the security of a country, that is another example. All of these are being, um, you know, done in a certain way, which is called classical cryptography. And it is all at risk of being compromised with these quantum computers, which we heard about in the last talk. While quantum computing will do lots of very interesting things for us, very important things, it will also do certain things which will be harmful if we are not prepared for it in some sense. And so the solution also has to come from the quantum domain, which is called quantum cryptography. So now these are all examples of means of communication, which we are all very familiar with. We use them all the time. Maybe not so much the fax machine these days, but phones for sure. And nothing is very secretive about these, right? So, if, I mean, you know, we are talking to people, but it, there is no secret there. If, you know, many of us can watch the television together and so on. So this is not, there's no secret about this. But so what happens when something requires security? For instance, this online banking, you're giving your, you know, banking the uh, password to the computer and you know it's connecting to the bank you don't want someone else to get to know it right and so that is where the security aspects comes in in communication and that is done traditionally by what is called cryptography so you have a plain text message you encrypt it using what is called a key okay you form the cipher text it goes to the receiver the receiver also has a copy of a key to decrypt it and receive the message so this is how it looks. So this is called the Vernam cipher. It's again an, an example of cryptography. So if I want to send this message, Vernam cipher, right, as you see on the screen, I actually, this is a simple example that I have taken. So I can just replace all these alphabets with their position in the alphabet series, okay, A being zero and so on and so forth. So I have a key here, which is a random string of numbers, okay, and the operation I've performed is simple addition. So I have now replaced 21 by 23, 4 plus 3, 7, and so on and so forth. And then again, gone back to their alphabet uh, counterpart. So 23 is X, 7 is H, and so on. So now this X, H, S, R, F, 
so on and etc is sent across to the receiver so obviously this is something which does not betray by, in, by any stretch of the imagination that we were trying to send vernam cipher okay so now the receiver receives this string of alphabets goes on to find out the position in the alphabet series then he also he or she also has a copy of this key okay and then does the reverse operation so here it is subtraction you get back this 21 4 17 etc and then when you get back to the alphabet counterpart you have vernam cipher so we have managed to send this through uh, you know something which is sent uh, across the public channel which does not really uh, tell you what it is unless you have the key and so this is the process of encryption and decryption and this is how cryptography works and there are different types of keys private keys in fact this enigma machine was used in the second world war for such purposes uh, there is public key in the public key the important example that i want to highlight is what is called the rsa algorithm and this public key um, uh, cryptography which is uh, you know an example is an rsa algorithm is based on the hardness of a certain mathematical problem so here i have something which is not looking like a mathematical problem but i'm sure you know most of you in the audience are responsible for the left side of the screen right so i'm sure people like me are always telling you at the end of the day what have you done you know why is there such a mess in your room i do that with my daughter all the time and so this is an example of a um, of a situation which is easy to create so you just throw all the clothes you know they dump it on the ground and then somebody takes care of it right so this is easy but then the situation on the right is not so easy. Why is that? Because it takes a lot more time. So, you know, you separate it out into colors, you sort of wash them, iron them, put them in the cupboard. This takes a lot more time. So these are reverse problems, obviously. So this has led to that. And this could easily lead to that if you just throw them on the ground. But they are not the same hardness class of problem. And so that is uh, what RSA protocol is based on, of course, not on the clothes problem, but in fact, on a similar class of problems, uh, which is you know, a reversible problem. So you have multiplication and factorization. So the product of three and seven is 21 is something you all will just shout out to me if I ask you, right? But if I ask you, what are the prime factors of one, one, two, three, seven, one? That is not an easy problem. So factorization and multiplication are, of course, reverse of each other, but they're not the same hardness class. And so this is what the uh, you know this rsa protocol is based on the hardness of the factorization problem but here we have peter shore who has come up with the shore's algorithm which actually uh, uses quantum gates and can change the hardness class of the factorization problem so it's not as hard a problem anymore if you run it on a quantum computer so the quantum computer that vijay talked about is actually going to uh, break the hardness of the factorization problem as a result, RSA protocol gets compromised and our security is then compromised. So what is the then what is the take home message here? Computational resources grow very fast and today's hard problem could be solved tomorrow using a brute force attack. You can have new algorithms for classical computers. In fact, you know, the audience here consists of bright high school students, and I'm sure they come up with algorithms for things all the time. Maybe you can come up with something which breaks the factorization even without using a quantum computer. Of course, there is quantum computer itself. So my security should be independent of future advancements in computational power, new algorithms or new technology. That is, it should be future secure. And so this brings forth the need for quantum cryptography, where security is based on laws of nature or laws of physics or more so laws of quantum physics and not on the mathematical complexity of a problem. Okay? And the most important part is the quantum key distribution part. So this, as you saw, it is the key distribution which needs to be secure. So once the key is present with the receiver, then of course, you know, everything is good. It should only be between the sender and the receiver and not any third party. So that is where the security aspect comes in. Having said that, you know, uh, the kind of quantum computer which would solve this sort of a problem, which was, you know, the Microsoft research has declared that a quantum computer could do it in 100 seconds, uh, actually would require 4,000 qubits and 100 million gates. And as was pointed out in the last talk, we are not there yet. We are still at the level where we have a smaller number of qubits and a smaller number of gates. But the research is going very fast in the domain of quantum computing. So we need to be prepared with a solution now so that when the quantum computer actually comes, which can actually solve these problems, which may be a few years down the line, uh, we don't have it as a problem anymore. And we have a solution which is based on laws of quantum mechanics. Okay. And so these are you know, things which have already been uh, discussed by various people before me in this session. So the uncertainty principle, 
or essentially also what is the no cloning theorem. So you cannot copy an unknown quantum state. And these are the principles on which we base a certain class of protocols for key distribution, which is called, uh, you know, for instance, the popular one is what is the BB84 protocol. This is based on these principles of quantum mechanics. Then we have the other class, which is based on quantum entanglement, which was also discussed, uh, which is, uh, for instance, the Eckert 91 protocol, which is the first one, BBM 92 and so on. So that there are different principles of quantum mechanics on which we base these key distribution protocols to keep the uh, communication secure. Okay. So uh, just to give you a little example of the BB84, the general idea, of course, you know, there are lots of concepts which perhaps are uh, not, uh, you know, yet taught to you about basis and so on. But if you've been taught vectors, then you would know uh, about basis a little bit. So the zero and the 90 are orthogonal to each other. We call it the rectilinear basis. And the 45 and minus 45 or 45 and 135 are also orthogonal to each other, and that is the diagonal basis. So in fact, we have a single photon, and that was discussed by Shubhroto in the beginning, that a single photon uh, is something, of course, quintessential in quantum key distribution. So a single photon, and we actually, uh, you know, uh, basically encode it in one of these four possibilities, okay? And I will do this through color coding. So this R uh, uh, with the zero bit is the red, the diagonal zero is yellow, the rectilinear one is blue and the diagonal one is green. Okay, so these are the four possibilities in which I encode my single photon. Okay, and then I send this is happening randomly. Randomly, Alice here, who's the sender, selects one of these four possibilities and sends it across the channel. Okay, and then on the other end, we have Bob who's actually doing the measurement, who also has these four possibilities to measure in. So two bases and four uh, you know, states in that. So he measures again randomly in one of these four possibilities. So essentially Alice can send you know, R0, D0, R1, R1, D1, let's say, and so on. And Bob can continuously measure. As you can see, there is no uh, uh, discussion between them. Bob randomly measures in one of these four possibilities, Alice randomly sends in one of these four. Then later on, they actually talk to each other through a public channel and compare. What is it that they have used to measure, uh, to encode and measure? They don't tell each other about the bits, only the basis is uh, you know, declared. And then uh, they actually discard all those cases in which they don't match, okay? So these are all cases in which they don't do the same thing. So they discard that and only retain these. And this is how they get a set of bits with each other, uh, which are the same. And uh, you know, uh, this fact of using these you know, non-orthogonal bases here actually uh, is uh, the basis for the security, which I won't get into because it's a bit of a detail, but this is the general idea of how this uh, is done. And so why do we need entanglement? Again, you know, entanglement uh, was not discussed in the sense of what it is, but we were using it earlier. So this is an example you know, of two balls, which are red and green in color, and they have been sent by Chanakya to Akbar and Birbal, okay? And so the question that Akbar asks is, you know, what's your color? And Birbal says, you know, no idea. Then Akbar opens his box, okay? And says, this is green. And then Birbal, even without opening says, mine must be red, okay? So basically the fact that Akbar's ball is green already, you know, indicates. So then Akbar asks this question, how does Birbal know this? Okay. Birbal knows this because these two, share a correlation with each other, okay? So if one of them is green, the other happens to be red. And if one of them is red, the other is green. This is something that is a shared correlation at the source level. And this is what uh, is called quantum entanglement. In fact, uh, the, the perfect example of entanglement, if I just were to explain it in layman's terms, is like an orchestra, right? So you have an orchestra where you listen to different pieces of music, Okay, the piano, the cello, the violin, and so on. And together, they give you this feel for the, you know, the, the symphony that you wanted to hear. So this whole is more than the sum of parts. If you hear them individually, it's, uh, you know, it's also very nice, but it's not the symphony. It's only together that you get the symphony. So whole being more than the sum of parts is essentially the idea of quantum entanglement, where there is a correlation, which is quantum in nature. And this forms the basis for a certain class of these quantum key distribution protocols, which is called device independent, in the sense that if we don't even trust our devices, then also we can do this communication securely. There we need entanglement, okay? So having said that, uh, you know, uh, uh, next few minutes, I'll just tell you a little bit about the kind of experiments that we are doing at our lab at RRI Bangalore. We are working on uh, long distance uh, transmission of this information through satellites. 
that is called satellite based quantum key distribution. We are working on integrated photonics based approaches. So essentially, you know, little chips where we would have QKD happening. Our quantum key distribution is called QKD. So these chips can be in our cell phones and so on. So that is one approach. We are also doing what is called quantum teleportation. And I'm sure now I have an audience which definitely sees, you know, science fiction stuff. So you know about teleportation from these things, but it's quite not quite as dramatic as that. We don't teleport human beings or objects per se, but just the state of the object can be transferred from one object to another, okay, by using quantum entanglement. And that's another means of communication. And we are also working on different ways of generating random numbers, which forms a fundamental, uh, you know, a part of quantum key distribution as well, okay. And so these are, are these BB84. These are this is how they look in the lab. You know, this is you know to give you a feel, just like Shubhrato was showing you about the microscopes and so on. This is how optics experiments look. Okay, so all these components with lasers and so on uh, is how Alice and Bob end up looking. And we have done some interesting experiments on them, uh, even using entanglement, as I said. So this is how now the entanglement-based experiment looks with the uh, source here, and these are the Alice and the Bob modules and so on, okay? And uh, of course, uh, you know, we have also done something interesting. If, you know, nowadays uh, children are very interested in uh, coding, right? So we have actually come up with a software where we can simulate quantum key distribution. And in fact, you know, the simulation is very good because, you know, it tells you uh, in the beginning, if I put in all these components, what kind of answer I might expect from my system, even if my system is not perfect, okay? And we call this QKD sim. And in fact, uh, uh, we got a lot of uh, you know, public attention for some of these uh, you know, developments that we have been doing. A lot of it is uh, actually a focus towards increasing the distance of this communication, because ultimately, you know, the security is going to be useful when you know, India wants to, let's say, talk to Canada. Uh, so then they want to do it in a secure way without uh, uh, some other country getting to know. That is where the actual utility lies for secure communication. And all this long distance communication seemed like a science fiction few years ago, but then now it has become very much science because you know there are lots of developments globally, including in India, where lots of interesting things are happening. Okay. And so why do we need to increase the distance? Of course, I explained, but it's not straightforward. Somebody might ask, you know, we already have long distance communication for the classical. Then why is it something extra is needed for the quantum? That is because, you know, in quantum, if you want to do this through free space, uh, ultimately beyond a point, you can't see each other because the earth is round. So that is called the line of sight problem. But if you want to do this through optical fibers, which you have heard of, right? Then also beyond a point, you need to boost the signal for which you need to copy the signal. And that is not allowed in quantum mechanics because of no cloning theorem. So you need to think out of the box. And, and one of the approaches is to use a satellite, okay? A satellite comes uh, to one of the ground stations, it exchanges a quantum key, then it goes to some other place in the world, exchanges a quantum key. And as a result, these two places are now connected securely using a quantum link. This is what is called satellite-based quantum key distribution. And uh, you know, the, our idea is to go, go towards this domain where we have a global quantum communication network. Different countries are connected with each other through satellite links as well as fiber links. And uh, our experiment is uh, an, a collaboration with our space agency. You perhaps have heard of ISRO. So we are collaborating with ISRO on India's first project on satellite-based quantum uh, communications. And our aim is essentially to uh, you know, establish uh, quantum communication between two Indian ground stations using a satellite as a trusted node. Okay, and so these are our ground stations at RRI, and uh, you know you can visit us if you are in Bangalore or elsewhere, for instance. And we did this free space communication between two buildings again, uh, first time in India, which was very nice because this can then be scaled up towards longer uh, distances. Again, uh, uh, lots of you know people appreciated our work, and we were called one of the twenty major success stories also by our government. And all this is very important because, you know, then the students and young people like you, you should be motivated to work in quantum because it's a very important topic these days. And a lot of, uh, you know, uh, innovations are happening in India already. And, and, you know, some of it, of course, has been covered by the people here, but then there is a lot more left for you to explore. Okay. So with that, uh, I would like to end my own talk. And uh, so thank you for listening to me, of course. And um, yeah. If you have any questions for my talk or anyone else, uh, we can have a QA &A now. Yeah, thank you. Himanshu, you have raised hand. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. My question is like that if we compare 
uh, Schrodinger's principle with the quantum computing, and that Schrodinger's principle says that the cat is alive or dead. And if we compare a two qubit file, which is four possibilities, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, and zero, one. So let's let's come. Uh, let's think that zero, zero is dead. One, one is alive. Then what does zero, one, and one, zero depict with the cat? Yeah. So see, uh, it's, first of all, yeah, it's it's a nice question. So the Schrodinger cat is an example of a single superposition, right? So you have one cat which could be dead or alive, or in a superposition of being dead and alive. So that I would say, if I want to draw the analogy directly with a qubit, I would say it's a single qubit. So a single qubit, uh, which can be up or down, or in this case, a bit of up and a bit of down for the Schrodinger cat, because you can't see what is happening to the cat inside the box. But then if you now scale it up to more than one qubit, then you will also have to scale the number of cats. So you will have two cats and three cats and so on, because a cat here represents one quantum bit. So you cannot just you know, say that the cat remains one and then you scale the qubits because that is the analogy that is being drawn here the, with, the, with the cat alive and dead. So the alive and the dead are the two states of a single qubit. Hope that answers the question, Manchu. Yes, thank you. So anyone has any questions for anyone really? I think most of our speakers are still here. So if you have anything to say, so because we are kind of, I mean, you know, we're finished with our talks now. Uh, is there any possibility that uh, quantum computers can be analog? Quantum computers can be analog. No, I think quantum computers need to be digital. Vijay, you have any comments on that? Uh, yes. So the kind of um, uh, simple picture I showed you, those quantum computers are digital in the sense that they use uh, qubits. Uh, there is something called an analog uh, quantum computer, but we refer to them more as uh, quantum simulators. Um, they are more like, uh, you know, custom built machines for solving a particular problem. And sometimes they are called analog uh, quantum computers as well. But the, uh, the most general, what we uh, are trying to build called the universal quantum computers, they are uh, digital. The analog ones are uh, custom designed for specific problems. For instance, the D-Wave ones you are perhaps talking about, right? D-Wave is one, but even uh, any, if, uh, if one is trying to model a particular quantum mechanical problem, right. you uh, some other quantum system which you can control. So these are, which we call them quantum simulators, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Shishti uh, has written. Exploring, wondering if there was a way I could put in. Yeah. So Shishti has asked whether uh, she could uh, contact us and other speakers in the future. Yes, of course. I mean, you know, that was the, I mean, you know, our humble attempt was to actually, you know, motivate you to think more about this. And we are going to be very happy to, you know, help you think. So, I mean, of course, all our um, contact details can be easily found on the, on our, you know, I mean, you can easily just search for us and then you find them. Mine, of course. Uh, is on the RRI website, but if you can, if you write to me, I can share the contact details for other speakers as well with you. I'm sure everyone is okay with that, with students approaching us after the session for any questions, right? Uh, yes. yeah. uh, I'm putting my email address. Yeah, you're putting it. So we can all do that then if that works for you. Yeah. Okay, so while we do that, if there is anything else that anyone wants to say, you can go ahead. I think anyway, uh, we are nearing dinner time for the students because they all have school tomorrow, right? So it's not yet Easter break for them. So I think um, if there are no further questions now, so we can, uh, we can end the session now. So I would like to thank um, all the speakers, uh, all the external speakers specifically for, for giving your valuable time. And I would also like to thank the three students who have been very useful and very helpful in this organization. So Somi Ranjan Behera, Ashleen Jacob and Mehek Leal are all here with us, I hope. Yeah, so I can see you guys. So thanks a lot. So I think, you know, all the posters and everything, I mean, the call was all coordinated by them. So if anything went wrong, it is their fault. And, and so <laughs> thanks a lot. So I think we will then uh, end the session. Organizing this uh, along with your team. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Vijay. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.